I guess I would still favor Poirier. I do worry about the damage that he's accrued over the years and what that might do to him. But I don't know. He, uh, you know, he, he's amazing too. Uh, he is a remarkable fighter. And I think he's just got, you know, I don't know if he's the best boxer in the UFC, whatever that means, but I put him on the short list. Yeah. I put agreed. him on the short list for sure. He's tremendous. So I probably lean Poirier, but it's, it's a toss. Tomorrow up. from Brendan Schaub. It's dicey, dicey. <laughs> Now, Brandon Thick Boy Shop. Mr. Luke Thomas, the best in the business, man. You know I have to send out that Luke Thomas bat signal because on Showtime, uh, my brother from a different mother, you're, you're, I think, are you working the uh, Spence Crawford fight Do you, in some capacity? Like a pre-show or yeah, something yeah, like yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would have been out there uh, starting on Wednesday, but I actually lucked into a situation where my contract is weird for folks who may not know. So um, I am technically an employee of CBS, but Showtime produces the podcast that I'm on, right? So there's these two, and they're both owned by Paramount. So they kind of work together to make it all kind of go. But sometimes I do stuff exclusively for CBS. So out of nowhere, uh, CBS invited the podcast to go to Stanford, Connecticut on Thursday. And from, let me see if I get this right. On Thursday from 10 a.m. to noon, we're going to do a live Spence Crawford two-hour preview um, on CBS Sports. So then... That is over at noon. I got a bird to take from there to Vegas that night. Then Friday, I'll do weigh-ins. And then Saturday, I'll do uh, the prelims. I'll call the prelims. Yeah. Oh, sick, brother. Congrats, man. I Yeah, I saw Thanks. that. That's big. And then, uh, so it's, it's, it's going to be morning combat that you're flying out for tomorrow when you guys do the two-hour long thing in Connecticut. Yeah, just morning morning combat only for CBS Sports. Gotcha. And then I'm flying out separately, yeah. And that makes sense. So I'm surprised I haven't had you guys work more. I mean, this is such a massive fight, but because your your co-host, Brian Campbell, his background's boxing, right? Like he knows boxing yes. like a motherfucker. And then you know yes. all, all of it, but Brian Campbell specializes in boxing. So he's a good one to have. Yeah, well, actually it'll work out the opposite. So uh, he has some kind of uh, uh, issue where he, he can work, but he can't go to Vegas. So what's actually going to end up happening is for morning combat, we're going to have two post-fight shows on Saturday night. One for Spence Crawford, one for UFC 291, and then he'll host the UFC 291 one because I won't be able to watch it, obviously. And I'm, then I'm going to do the Spence Crawford one. But you know what? The thing is, like, I've been covering, I covered boxing for a while back in the day, and then uh, things changed when my last, well, not my last job, but when I was at MMA uh, fighting through Vox Media, um, when MMA fighting came aboard, I, I had to stop doing a lot of boxing coverage. I covered Mayweather Pacquiao for them. I covered Mayweather Canelo. Oh, wow. I covered Lamont Peterson versus Amir Khan. I, I mean, I used to cover boxing fairly regularly, had to get away with it, got, got back into it the last four years. So at this point, I feel a little bit more confident, you know, to do a post fight show, but uh, you know, it is a strange time, I suppose, to break, to divvy it up that yeah, way. Yeah, You boys are working though. It's a lot of work, man. A lot of shows, a lot of content. But it's a good business to be in, especially the fight business right now, because like you said, Saturday you have UFC 291, which is a big dog, which we'll talk about. But I, I feel like, and just maybe it's the group of guys I'm around, The I'm in Calabasas, California, maybe it's that. I feel like there should be more hype for Spence Crawford, man. Like this is a fight the boxing fans have been waiting for for how long? And now Showtime made yeah. it happen. Shout out to Showtime. It's coming to fruition here. You're talking about, you know, two undefeated fighters. One guy 28 no, what's the other guy? 39 and no. It's insane. Yeah. Like, it's nuts. Yeah. But I just feel like I mean I and I and I I asked my team this, and it, maybe I should fire him, I don't know, but I go, are you guys are you guys more likely to buy? Are you more excited for this, this can make you throw up? I said, are you more excited for uh Spence and Crawford? or Nate Diaz and Jake Paul. And they're like, if we have Ooh. to pick one, we're going Nate Diaz, Jake Paul. I said, get out. He really? This is shit. Wow. But yeah, but that I feel like there's, you know, I don't know. Like what, what sells more pay-per-views? Um, that's a good question. Do we know the pay-per-view price point for the Diaz fight yet? Do we know that? Is it forty nine ninety nine? I might be. I honestly don't know. Yeah, I mean, you, if there's a because you got you got to imagine they're going to probably charge. I'm going to. I don't know this. I'm going to guess upwards of seventy or eighty for Spence Crawford. Again, I haven't. Don't 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 quote me on that. But probably I'm, I'm assuming that. Yeah, probably seventy nine ninety nine yeah. for the HD. And 
And so I don't know. So if there's a substantial difference in pay-per-view, that will obviously affect bias. I mean, here's what I'll say, right? Like Showtime is kind of coming off of, not that people are making direct comparisons, but we're kind of coming off of uh, not too long ago, the Tank Davis and Ryan Garcia fight, which was fucking huge, right? I mean, that was a monster fight, right? And I know you know Ryan personally and everything. So, So it can't compare to that. Tank is one of the biggest stars in boxing, just on pure star terms. Ryan Garcia, one of the biggest stars in boxing on just pure star terms. Spence and Crawford aren't that. And so it won't be that. But I still think it will do. I mean, here's my sort of official guess. I'm going to guess between five to 750K pay-per-view buys. I agree with that. Which is still very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, still very good. I think Diaz will probably do somewhere around that, maybe slightly less, but still probably pretty good as well. Jake Paul came out. I understand. I understand. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. That's that's me. Just to to wrap up, I think, you know, it's okay. Just to wrap up, I just feel like um, you're right. Like, it's not Garcia and Tank, but... It, I think in the I think by the time Friday and then Saturday gets here, the buzz is really going to build. And when you think about it, I mean, don't get me wrong. Tank Davis is must see TV. He's the best knockout artist in boxing right now, and his whole kind of persona out there is insane. So you know, he brings a heavy spotlight. So is Ryan Garcia. When you're talking about straight up boxing, like as far as talent goes, I mean, this is the best fight we've seen in I don't know how long between these two, between Spence and Crawford. I mean, oh. talent wise, it's one for oh. the ages. This is, uh, man, I struggle to think about what the most, I mean, people compare it because of, of the relevancy it had in terms of determining, you know, generational talent, as well as, you know, the best fighter of, of that moment to Mayweather Pacquiao. Now it's not going to do Mayweather Pacquiao numbers. I, I don't, you know, obviously that's not really in the, in the, in the cards, but in terms of like what it means for the sport, it's pretty close in the sense of, again, the celebrity and the, the, the size of the fight, notwithstanding just the actual boxing terms it's to decide basically the pound for pound best guy in the sport. And you talk about it. I did a, I did a one hour breakdown on all of Errol Spence's game. You can check that out at youtube.com slash morning combat for folks who have it. it. And dude, like i Thanks, man. I, I break down a lot of film and, you know, I'm always honored to break down. Please, you know, I want to be clear about this. Like, it's always an honor to watch professionals do something and be like, wow, you learned so much. Dude, it was a treat to watch Spence's game up close. And I couldn't believe some of the shit he's able to pull off. He is, he is just, he you know what he is, man? He's a fucking Terminator. Yep. He's a Terminator. He just clubs these guys to, to, into submission. And then on the other side, you have Bud Crawford, who is, I don't think this is in any way an exaggeration. People can take issue with it if they want. I think a boxing genius. Yep. I think one of the highest fight IQs I've ever seen. And those two hammers are going to meet. <laughs> People have said, by the way, Brendan, they've said things like, oh, well, is the fight going to be boring? First few rounds, you might not have like the most dynamic action, but the entire Errol Spence game is built on pressure, volume, and just absolutely beating guys down into not literal submission, but something approximating it. And while Bud's game is all about courting danger to get just the right shot, by the end of that fight, I suspect it's going to be on fire. Yeah, I I can't wait. And I was I was looking uh, before we we spoke. I was looking just like what are the experts, kind of the guys who were have been in the game for a long time. Who are they siding with? I'd say the majority of them are siding with uh, Bud Crawford. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's what I've seen as well. I mean, listen, I under I I kind of get that right. Like Bud has a little bit more magic to his game. You know what I mean? He's got a little mm-hmm. bit more of that spellbinding ability to just find the right shot and the right combination. He's a devastating finisher. And remember, he was already undisputed in another weight class. This is the second weight class Jesus. where he's tried to become undisputed. I think the thing that people miss, at least as far as I'm concerned, is that I think Spence, well, for sure, Spence has a better resume in this weight class at 147 pounds. And you could probably argue a better resume overall in terms of who he's fought. That one's a little bit more debatable. But, you know, I just don't, there isn't the same kind of dazzle to what Spence does. And I don't know that that's affecting how people view the fight, but I kind of feel like it might be. I feel like, too, and it's a shame. I feel like a lot of it is because, you know, I've had, I, I, I've either had both of them on food truck when I was at Showtime or just Bud, but they're not 
they're the two best boxers on the planet. But when it comes to entertainment value, like your TikToks, <laughs> your Instagram, you know, like Bud, he's just very dry and he, all he cares about is boxing. Like he's the nicest guy in the world. But, you know, he's not going to, you know, you're not going to get any great sound bites from the press conference. You know, yeah, I'm going to beat him up. I'm going to knock this guy out. But you're not getting a Conor McGregor or, a, you know, even a, a, a Garcia, Ryan Garcia take there. It's just not what they do. And unfortunately, the public put so much into that. I'm like, you're missing it, though. If you want the two best boxers on the planet that are finally fighting and, you know, it'd be an easy argument. Terrence Crawford, Errol Spence is a better fight than many Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather. When they fought, they were not oh, in the yeah. prime. It's not even close, you idiots. Oh, so yeah. with, with Spence and Crawford, yeah, I, this is I mean, the real deal, man. Yeah. I mean, you could argue that this, you know the fight between Spence and Crawford should have happened a little bit earlier. And I don't think that that's in any way unfair. But, you know, you're not like, you know, Manny. After, remember Manny after the, the Pacquiao? Or excuse me, Manny after the Mayweather fight was like, oh, my shoulder was all jacked up. And on. then fans tried to sue him. Yeah. And all that yeah. shit, dude, you just, you're, you're not going to get that with these two. It's just not going to be that way. Um, again, one guy might be way better than the other one. Some of the rounds might be uh, hard to call early. I don't know about that part, but in terms of getting guys a little bit closer, or in the case of Spence, I would argue right smack in the middle of his prime. Um, or, you know, I would say the, the probably, this is probably the end of his prime, but I think he's still in it. Yep. Uh, it's just radically different, radically different than that. I have significantly higher hopes as well. Me put too. It. I can't wait. I can't wait. Yeah. I wanted to talk to you about it because no one around here really knows boxing. So it's, it's an exciting one. So you have that, but, but, be, but isn't, right? but isn't it funny? Like, because everyone's like, Oh, you know what I hate about boxing is the best. Don't fight the best. It's like, well, yeah, here you go. You know, but yeah. boys, I got to tell you, yeah. uh, if you want the best fight in the best, I have great news for you. Yeah, Saturday, so buy it, tune you in. Idiots, <laughs> buy it. This is what you guys complain about. They said it's a problem with box. My UFC is doing well. You know, you'll be at the, at the fight, working the fight, but you know, you're missing a pretty damn good UFC 291. That card's pretty stacked, dude. That card's pretty I know. tasty. I know. Really tasty. But I, say, I, I, I was saying this too. I was saying this too. So check this out. So, I mean, I don't know when this is going to air, but uh, at, the, at the time of Thursday, okay. By the time of you and I recording this, tomorrow is uh, in a way in Fulton, which is going to be that's more for boxing hardcore, but it's still an extremely relevant fight in boxing. Then, of course, on uh, Saturday, you've got two ninety one sick. You got Spence Crawford. You've even got a little bit of Bellator versus Ryzen, which has a, a couple of good bangers on that one as well. I'm just sort of pointing out whatever your crown jewel is, whether it's the MMA side or whether it's the boxing side, dude. What a week! What a weekend for combat sports, huh? You've got one of the, you got Everything. the BMF for, you know, whatever, whatever people, whatever a value people want to ascribe to the belt. You know, if you had to pick two BMF candidates, them two would be right. at the top of the list. Yep. Then you got Spence Crawford on the other side. Dude, this is our cup truly runneth over with this, you know? Yeah. For our gig, it's a great deal. But really, if you look at the whole year, like there's a lot of cool stuff happening, man. In the fight game, like you got Francis Fury got announced. You got John Jones Stipe coming up. Like, there's a lot of cool stuff happening, man. What's your What's your uh, temperature, so to speak, on Francis and uh, Fury? Um, I was one of the guys. I'm I'm close with Francis' agent Markel. I'm I'm close with him, so I talked to him pretty frequently about it. When the PFL deal got announced, I think people are missing the point because when that PFL deal got announced, I went, okay, well. For him to leave the UFC, they have to know that the Fury fight can happen. Because if he left the UFC just signed with PFL, terrible idea. Even though the PFL, you know, they they're giving him all that guaranteed, you know, money and half the gate and the pay per view, it's nuts. That business model is not going to work. There's there's no way. So that can't be the move. I said the only way that it works out for for Francis is, is if he gets that big marquee fight with Fury or Joshua Wilder. If that doesn't happen, he made a mistake. And everyone just, you know, was hounding Francis, making fun of him, saying horrible, who's he going to fight and all that stuff in PFL. I don't care about PFL. It's not about the PFL. His fuck you money comes from fighting Fury. And he made it, it took some time, but he made it happen. So no matter if he gets knocked out in the first second or first round, doesn't matter. He, what he did is unheard of. It's, it's a win for Francis. So it's a huge win for Francis. And it's also, I talk about it on my show, it's like, be careful because you know, Dana White, the UFC, they don't want this fight to happen. They don't like when guys go on and do these things. Also, you know, the, the other matchmakers in boxing didn't want this fight to happen. They want fear to fight Usyk. So there's going to be a lot of news coming out, fake news, you know, for lack of a better term, a lot of fake news. At first it was, 
he's only making eight million dollars that's not true then it was it's an exhibition fight it's not real that's not true it's 10 rounds you know so it's like they're trying to like put a wet blanket on this thing it's just not working so i think it just shows you that francis is a threat i think he made the right choice and no matter what he's going to walk away from this way way richer which was the which was the plan i don't care what happened to pfl that's a side note i don't care yeah dude like i mean dep- i mean i don't think this is likely i'm not saying that i uh, expect this but you couldn't like rule it out and what i mean is my guess is he francis will probably pull somewhere between when it's all said and done between like 30 and 40 million but that could go higher right so let's right. just say it's i don't know 50 60 million maybe even 75 million that seems a little excessive but you know you get the idea do you even need to fight after that <laughs> you know what i mean like that that's that what it's icing on the cake ton of money yeah dude and it's like in the you know, people are like, oh, he should, could have fought John. They offered him the most money in the heavyweight division of all time. It's like, okay, did they offer him 40 million though? So he's won. Right. Like he made the right choice. Who's he going to fight in PFL? Dude. Who gives a shit? Some poor sucker who's <laughs> getting knocked out that we're not going to watch, but he's won as far as boxing goes. That's all that, that was his whole point, man. He's done it. Yeah. He'll, he'll, he'll make more in that one fight than uh, not only from that last contract they offered, but that contract plus every other contract he had in MMA. So, correct. you know, uh, he gets the last, he, uh, assuming it all goes through, he will have the last laugh, but it was funny just to, just to like bring it full circle. Bud Crawford, I guess, did his open workout at like the UFC PI, I think, or something like that, mm-hmm. maybe the apex or whatever, something like that. Uh, some UFC facility. And, uh, so he was doing media day there for himself. And, uh, and one of the reporters was like, Hey, what chance? I think it was an MMA reporter. Like what chance do you give Francis? He was like zero <laughs> fucking zero. 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 He, didn't, yeah. he was like, he didn't even say like point one. No zero. zero. I was like, but I, but I will say, yeah, he's right. But I will say this. And again, I don't care about any of that. Francis getting paid. If he gets slobber knocked in a second, he still made the right choice. But I will say this, and you know that's how I got in with Showtime. I, I was the the MMA expert for Conor versus Floyd, so I had to sell people on Conor beating Floyd, which you know it's a paid gig. I tried my best, man. It was a tough one. But Francis has more of a chance to win than Conor does because Francis has that one knockout, one shot knockout power. Like if I don't give a fuck if you're Tyson Fury, Alistair Overeem, you know Mark Hunt, I don't care Roy Nelson, I don't care who you are. If Francis lands with four ounce gloves or 10 ounce gloves on that fight's over dude so he there he has a better shot to land that than connor does beating floyd mayweather that's all i'm saying yeah yeah Not, neither one's too, gonna win but i'm just saying right yeah i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't bet against fury either but um you know the interesting part was like i remember you know paulie malinacci you know paulie too i like paulie a lot actually like, i love in mma yeah, people never may kind of get down on him, but um, <laughs> yeah, he he he, uh, you know, because his thing with Connor just it, it didn't really go all that well for him. But like one thing he was really right about was like his power doesn't translate to boxing. That we've only had the one fight, so you know, would it be different in another one? I don't know, but it didn't translate that night for sure. I have a feeling Francis's power will translate, but um, I guess we will see. Uh, what was that October twenty eighth? October. Now let me ask you this: That's two weeks before John Jones Steep a Mass Square Garden. What sells more pay-per-views? I'm asking again, what sells more pay-per-views? Francis Fury or Stipe Ooh. John Jones Man Square Garden? That card's going to be loaded, but I just feel like Francis and, and Fury, they sell more pay-per-views when it reaches out beyond just our fight base. It's a great question. Also, you know what's kind of funny? You know Dana White has to hate the fact that uh, Fury and Ganu is going to be on ESPN Plus pay-per-view. Yes. So, you know, they're the... the the pay-per-view provider and of course they're probably all too happy to collect those checks hell yeah but um to answer the question it's okay so working against fury and ganu is less so ufc but more that it's going to be in the afternoon in all likelihood right because if it's going to be in saudi arabia they're just going to have to time it in a way where it's just going to be you know middle to late afternoon that hurts, on the yeah. east coast or even earlier for you guys out there on the west coast so that will hurt it but like star attraction versus star attraction as i do think the jones steep if i will do well please don't misunderstand me but i think fury and ganu is a listen here's the thing i always try to explain to not so much to you because you know this but like to, to 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 hardcore mma fans it's like the biggest section of not just hardcore mma fans excuse me the biggest section of mma fandom and the biggest section 
of boxing fandom are the people who know the least about it, right? It's the the casual fans. Like you're pulling in people who know fuck all yep. about anything other than I know that guy's name. He's big and powerful. I know that guy's name. He's whatever. And they just want to see that collide. This is why like Spence Crawford has a little bit more of an uphill climb relative to that in that sense. So Jones is a big star. Stipe, obviously, I think with that in that matchup will complement him nicely for uh, top of the marquee. But Fury and Nganu together, that's just much more star power packed in, I think. But yeah, it's, <clears throat> we were talking about it. as far as the A side, clearly Fury's the A side. We just look at pay per view numbers yeah. and, you know, obviously, uh, I think the best heavyweight of all time. But Francis, in theory, isn't a pay per view star. If you look at his sales on with the UFC, that's why they're willing to let him walk. They went, we're good, man. Go ahead. His, his pay per view numbers were never great. So it's weird to expect that to go up here, you know? And if you compare Jones' pay-per-views and Stipe's, they trump Fury, especially Jones. So if you're going based off kind of pay-per-view, you know, uh, fight science or fight math, Jones and Stipe should sell more. But I think this is just such a special occasion, and you're bringing the boxing yes. world into it too, which makes it more unique. That I think it's going to outsell that UFC with Jones and Stipe. Could be wrong. That's right. So. No, no. I, I, so I think you're onto something. I, let me clarify. So if you're just stacking up individually star power and where it gets assigned, then Jones does have, I think, a credible claim, not for number one, maybe, but certainly for number two um, and even maybe number one, depending on how you want to look at it. But um, the, what I would say is the point that you raised at the end, right, which is you get this it, it, dude, I'm telling you, it's the people who know the least. It's the boxing versus MMA. Ooh, I want to see that crowd. Oh, a knock a tremendous knockout artist from MMA is going to fight this big mouthed uh, British heavyweight. That might be interesting, even though, you know, most uh, inside observers would be like, eh, that's a tough hill. That's a, tough, that's a tough hill climb for him. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's this weirdness that galvanizes everything. It's got the it's got more of that, like that pop culture pull than a strict, although very good MMA fight might have. And that's where the money comes from. That pop culture, once you get TMZ reporting on it and you know you got the guys at Starbucks talking about, that's who buys it and that's when you get make that fuck you money. But I, I think too what's right. interesting is as just a guy, who, Fury's my favorite fighter in combat sports. I love Fury, I've worked with him, he's one of my favorite people, he's a special person. As a, like, you know, I, I love boxing. I do wish he would have fought Usyk before this I think that's yeah. like hangs over his head a little bit in this goes, hold on, you're going to fight this MMA fighter who's never boxed over defend the battle against Usyk, who we think might beat you. He's like, yeah, I'm going to do this. And then that I wish he would have reversed it, fought Usyk earlier this year. And then he was fighting Francis in October. I just think it'd been better boxing kind of hardcores wouldn't be so upset if that Usyk fight wasn't looming out there. If he would have just got that done, I think this would have been even bigger. So if you talk to people inside boxing, one theory that has been floated to me is that what he might end up doing is fighting. Well, he's going to fight Francis. We, we know that. But then after that, it's, 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 it's rumored that he could turn around quickly, including as early as December, late December, like a Christmassy kind of time, and then fight Usyk then. Gangs. Now that is contingent. That's contingent upon a lot of different things going correctly, which we all know in combat sports is not smart to bet on. And I think if he does that, not not necessarily in December, but let's say you know first quarter of twenty twenty four or something. That's fine. Yeah, I don't think it'd be. Yeah, yeah, I don't, yeah, exactly. I don't think it'd be the end of the world. But I will say this: if he doesn't do that, and in fact he just takes this fight and then you know whatever does next, I mean, how can you say he didn't duck Usyk? How can you say that? How can you say he didn't, he, he would be literally avoiding a fight to take another fight. And that fight was for, you know, the one face, one name. That's the guy at heavyweight, unify all the titles, bang, you know, and he avoided that to fight Francis. Like, dude, it's so funny, you know, like when that fight got announced on the MMA side, because my feed is now filled with both sports yeah. on the MMA side, there were people who don't like Francis, but there was a lot of people who were like, yeah, Francis, go get that bag. You know, you saw a lot of people cheering him on. And then on the boxing side, it was like, yo, fuck Fury. Yeah. Who, what is he doing? Yeah. This is ridiculous. Dude, the boxing fans are mad, pissed mad. at Fury, you know? And I will say this again, as a big Fury fan, fan that Usyk fight ain't easy like you know that one scares me no. that like Usyk's a bad man dude like <laughs> you, the, you watch his fight against Joshua like oh my god dude this dude is a savage never lost in anything never lost he, he undersized is, he but is 
technical yeah. as a motherfucker and just a Ukrainian dog. So a part of me is like, oh man, that's a scary fight for Fury, bro. Like that ain't an easy. That's by far his toughest matchup. Oh, I don't think there's any question. I mean, you know, he the fight with Deontay is tough because Wilder has huge power, but he's not. He's overmatched from a skill standpoint relative to Fury. And I would say, you know, even if he fought Joshua, Joshua to me, a little bit chinny, uh, doesn't yeah. quite fight aggressively in the way that he used to, which is understandable given that he, you know, lost to Ruiz and whatnot. Um, so, and then also the Vladimir Klitschko fight was an amazing fight by him, but, you know, he got hit a lot in that contest as well. And I think that's kind of changed his style over time. So that's why I think he likes those fights. And don't get me wrong, he is an amazing, amazing talent. And like, you know, the gusto he's had at times has been, Truly, you know, you love guys who are daring. You know yep. what I mean? That's what you really love. And there was a time there where he was doing that. But Usyk is a complete, I mean, a cruiserweight who moved up, unified all the titles at cruiserweight. This is, again, like Bud Crawford, if he fought Fury, that would be the second weight class. He is trying to become undisputed, which means having, for folks who don't know, all four belts in the four belt era in all the, all the ones that matter, basically, um, at the same time, which would be remarkable. And to your point, high fight IQ, oh. um, fast for a heavyweight, relatively speaking, right? S smart, good to say. I mean, there's, there's just a lot of things about that that make that a very tough fight for Fury. So this is what I mean. Like, if you take the Francis fight because you also wanted the bag and then you take the Usyk fight, I get. But if not, it's like, dude, it's hard to just look at this and be like, yeah, you avoided the tougher challenge for the easier one, man. Like, just, it is what it is, you know? Yeah, I don't think it'd be as big of a deal if it wasn't his toughest challenge. Like, you know what in those box and like, yeah, it's a tough fight for Fury. Like it's just not right, some yeah. guy, some up and comer where fear is like, nah, get to it. It's like, no, he's the guy. He's the guy we think that can beat you. And so, yeah, for Fury's legacy, he has to do it. And he's going to piss off the boxing fans forever if he doesn't fight Francis and fight him shortly after, which I think he will. It's not like Fury's scared of him, for God's sakes. I hate when people say that. No, afraid, no, but I do think he respects what. Yeah. To, like you know like he knows that Usyk is not to be trifled with different right? like you have yeah. to be on point you know agree um let's get in some UFC uh 291 here man uh thoughts on the card or you know it I think it should be noted it is in Salt Lake City which is high elevation but the, the lighter weights not be the end of the world for a Gaethje for a Poirier I don't you know Poirier's out there Gaethje trains at high altitude so they'll be okay Derek Lewis is fucked and I think UFC did on purpose <laughs> They're like, hey, dude, you know damn well you can't go in the second, third at elevation. You get one round of fury. Let's get this guy out of here. So I think that was intentionally done. They're like, you got to go. You know damn well you can't get to the second, third round. Dude, you, you know, I, I might be misremembering this, but I don't think so. And I want to be clear, like anytime you see any, I was in the back for, I think it was, I, I want to say, I could be getting this wrong, but I think this is right. I was in the back for UFC 135. That's Jones versus Rampage. That was at the Pepsi Center, Denver, Colorado. Right? Uh, you know that well, I'm sure. And I remember being back there and seeing, I believe, Mark Hunt versus Ben Rothwell yes. on that card. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And I remember being backstage. Now, you got to understand, I think that fight went the distance or something pretty close to went it. Went the distance, you, yeah. You know, you see... Yeah. So you see guys come back from a three round UFC fight. Yeah, they're going to be a little fucked up. But I remember watching Mark Hunt and I'm not kidding. It must have been like 20 minutes. No, that's not quite that long because he went after he went to the triage place. He went back to his thing. But there was a there was a while there where I watched him and it looked like he could not get enough air. Like he just kept <gasps> like a like fish out of water. Hot, yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. Like just gulping it. And you, you uh, remember down. Dana ben Rothwell wasn't as bad. But. You remember Dana goes, we will, we will, after that fight at the press conference goes, yes, we will never put another heavyweight fight in Denver at high elevation ever again. And then shortly after that, yeah. you get, you know, Kane and uh, Verdum and, or was it Kane and Verdum in Mexico, which is even higher Mexico elevation, City, which Mexico is, City. which is even higher elevation. Nuts. Yes. Nuts. Yeah, dude, it's, it's a people like, if, you know, you know this really well, but like if you've never been at elevation and again, <laughs> for a high level, for a high level athlete, like to your point, um, Gaethje, who's accustomed to it, but even then a guy who's at sea level most of the time, like Poirier, I think he'll be just fine when it's all said and done. I mean, these are guys in incredible cardiovascular condition. They'll be OK, but dude. You know, if you if for folks who've never been at elevation, dude, it will fuck you up. And it takes a long time 
to really get used to it. Like, dude, I'll tell you a story. And this is not the same thing. And I'm not a high level. I'm not an athlete in any capacity. But for example, where my wife is from, she's from a place in South America that has even higher elevation than Mexico City. It's about another Damn. thousand. So Denver is about 5,000, give or take. Mexico City, I think, is about like 70, 7,200, 7,500. And then uh, where my wife is from, Bogota, Colombia, it's at 83 or 84. God damn. Right? Dude. Yeah, dude. There's they, uh, You get up that high and it'll mess with you a little bit. You, For example, you can't get sleep. It will throw off your sleep yep. schedule. Um, the high altitude at times will completely reduce your appetite. You have no desire to eat whatsoever. So you're not sleeping necessarily. You're not eating. You remember like Verdum went to Mexico City when he fought Kane well in advance. Kane was like, yeah, I'll show up the week of. Dude, week of at 7,500 feet is unacceptable. You will not be, your body absolutely will not be ready for it. So I hope, I don't know what Derek Luce has been doing. I don't know. I think the UFC did I hope he's been there a little while. Yeah, I think UFC is like, hey, dude, this is elevation. You got one round to get this done. I, I think he gets, <laughs> got it done against uh, Delima there. Uh, are you excited yeah. for the BMFL title? What's, what's your temperature on this? Are you one of those guys that can't wait to see it? I mean, I don't really. Here's the thing. I How do I explain this? It doesn't do anything for me or against me. I'm you with know, you. Like, I'm with you. 100%. That it's there. And I also want to say this. like, If the individual athlete takes pride in it, then I kind of have pride for them a mm -hmm. little. Uh, but if they don't, then I understand that too. I mean, what does the title really mean? You know, it, it, I don't know. It, I don't know what it means. It, I guess everyone can decide. Here's what I can say. These are two A-level fighters. They are still on the right side of 35. It's, folks forget this, Poirier was Gaethje's third UFC fight. Third UFC fight. He is a significantly different guy this time. Although, of course, so is Dustin Poirier. So for me, it's like there's so much quality and story in the fight that if they wanted to put a belt on it of dubious value or significance or even meaning, then I understand that. I and I understand and accept that. I just I can't get on here and be like, oh my god, I can't wait to see it. It's like, yeah, it's cool. It's cool. I, I, I don't want to be. You know what I mean? I don't want to be some hater on it. I'm not like, it's so terrible. It's it's fine. It's yeah, fine. that's where I'm at with it. It's fine. I, I think for me too with the BMFL title. I think I'd be more excited for them if it changed their pay structure too. Does that make sense? So if you become a legit champion, your pay structure is significantly different than if you're just a contender. If that title yes. winning the BMF, they went, yeah, you're getting the same, you know, kind of pay that you would get if you were an actual champion. That's like, damn, this actually means something. It doesn't mean too much. I mean, for the fans, it means a little something. So I'm like, all right, whatever. I'm excited for the fight. It's, it, I feel the same way about this. As the way I do about Makachev and Charles Oliveira too. I went, okay. Even though that's for oh, an actual title. Really? I went, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not hating any facet. They're two of the very best. Yeah. We just saw that fight. We, I just fucking saw Makachev destroy <laughs> Charles. I just saw it. And then they yeah. run it back. And it's not like a two-year, three-year layoff where Charles Oliveira has been in the lab. And he's, had, he's gotten better. And his confidence is different. He got one good win. And then they run it back. It's like, okay. Now, I don't know what else they would do at 55, so it makes sense. But like Makachev right. jumping to 170 was interesting. Him against Volkanovsky was fun. But this, I just went, all right, I've seen it. I don't think Charles beats him. So it's like, all right. Well, I'm a, I'm, I would say I don't think what you're saying is unfair. I would say I'm in a somewhat different position, which is... I don't really, I don't really take issue with the analysis uh, that you have. I think it's actually pretty fair, but there wasn't a big time between the first and second fights. Um, to your point, they didn't have really a. I think they wanted to do the Volk fight, but it just wasn't gonna wasn't gonna work. And also, Makachev versus Edwards, it's like, okay, I mean, these are two good fighters, but like, why the fuck are we doing this? Yeah, it's weird. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, it's it weird. Doesn't, yeah, it makes no sense. Holds it doesn't, up it doesn't really divisions. make sense. Yeah. yeah. So, but here's what I would say. Here's what I would say. I have a lot of respect for Benil Dariush. Uh, I have a lot of respect for his game. I have a lot. You know, he he lost against Charles Fair and Square, but for Charles Charles to beat him the way he did was like amazing. And we know Charles is capable of being both amazing and then being at times, you know, falling short. But what I mean to say is there was a couple of things he did differently in that fight that told me he learned his lesson. Like he used to always do a jumping spin kick to close distance, and a lot of guys would block it and. You know, he would use it to close distance or back him up against the fence. And he didn't do that at all this time because when he tried to do that shit against Makachev, he just got out of the way. It didn't go for him. Yep. And he kind of was confused. So it's like 
he was eliminating pieces of his game that were flashy but stupid or just real at a bare minimum just not valuable and you know do, to your point do i favor islam a second time yes yes i do i think islam is inherently a bad matchup for him but uh, I have more hope for Charles. I have I have more hope that Charles can turn in a better effort this time. And for that reason, and to your point, of there being nothing else really uh, uh, available, yeah, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm actually looking forward to it. All right. I, I, I mean, I get it. I, I, I wish I was more excited about it. I'm more excited about Jan and Alex Piera. Because there's like this mystery uh, there. Oh, yes. And that's the co-main event. And uh, I just feel like. My so my head's going. Jan's bigger dude. He has more MMA fights. He can take him down and end this thing pretty easy. But my heart's like, dude. I hope Alex Pierre wins. I hope he wins because the matchups at light heavyweight, if he's champion, are fantastic. Yuri Rakic, uh, fucking Johnny Walker. There's so many fun matchups. But they gave him the one besides uh, Magomedov. They gave him the one fight that's a kind of a disaster for him in Jan. I'm like, why would you do that? Could be. There, there's so many fun fights be. for him. You fucked them. It could be, too. It could be, you know, because uh, Pereira kind of holds his hands like this, you know, like he's kind of out here. Yep. Which is why he got counter from Izzy. He popped Izzy and then just didn't even, he didn't bring, he wasn't like this. You know, he didn't have his guard high or whatever. He just kind of pops him and then leaves Stay. it here. This is gigantic opening. So Izzy stung him for it. It's like, dude, well, if Izzy can do that at 185, you would imagine that Blahovic could do that at 205. But here's what I'll say, man. I And I know he fought, um, I'll just say this. In MMA, in MMA, I am very curious to see what Pereira's uh, punch resistance looks like at 205. Me too. Also, I, I want to see like what his build looks like at this point. Someone was saying he was walking around at like 230, 235, something like that. Yep. Uh, you know, and which is like, you know, you get trying to get down to 205, which I'm sure he'll do, but like, it's like, holy fucking shit. I mean, this guy is huge, Jack. huge. And the best part is like, dude, this, this division at the, at the top is kind of a mess with, you know, Hill got injured. I feel bad for Hill. And then Yuri had a whole thing. He's coming back. You didn't even mention on Kaliyev on Kaliyev's kind of sitting out there looking for a dance partner. Cause his fight with Jan suck the horn or at least it didn't resolve in uh, right. anything so it's like so you've got Pereira, Jan, Ankalaev, Rakic coming back, Walker. I mean dude, you know, to me it seems like the division has like what what okay, it doesn't have a dominant figure and I think that's always better to have a dominant figure than 100%. not. But but I am at a little bit of parity and some fun matchups if the UFC or the fights can shake out in a way where we can get those. And uh, in Kalaev, it's like get out of here dude. You get out of here. Like he's the one guy that's going to wrestle all these guys. You know, I hate to say it. He's a good dude and he's fun to watch. Get out of here. Because if, if Alex yeah. Piera, Yeri, uh, you know, you got fucking Johnny Walker, like let them have their fun. And Kalev, get out of here. Get out. We got to have some fun. Dude, here. I feel like on Kalev will strike with people when they're like a little bit overmatched, you know? Yeah. You know, but it's like against a dude, like, like, do we really think he's going to kickbox for five rounds with Alex Pineda? Like, I don't really think that, Absolutely you know not. what I mean? Now, so. Jan has, he, Jan did an interview in New York post, which is funny. New York post barely covers UFC and he was on the front cover there and he goes, I'm going to strike with him. My plan is to strike with Alex Pierre. I'm like, oh, this is just, this is just him baiting Alex. Like he thinks he's going to strike with him and he's going to shoot a double leg and drive him to the cage faster than anything. There's no way he's that stupid. He needs a win. He's also 40. You got to remember, Jan is 40. Is he really? Is he 40 years 40? of age? Good Lord. He is older than I thought he was then. Um, y you know what? He stood with Izzy for a little while. Now, Izzy's different. Izzy's different. different. Um, but, you know, he's not afraid of doing that. But I think you're right. Like, what if you, I mean, listen, Izzy kind of got a little shit when people were when people got mad at him when he was like, you know, I made the path for him when he was talking about getting to himself. I made the path for Pineda a little bit easier because he didn't have to go through all the wrestlers. He just got to go through a, a, a quickened path. He's right. And people had to kind of push back on that. But he was right. He He's was absolutely right. right. I mean, if you're Jan Blaho I mean, just honestly, if you're Jan Blahovich and his team, are you really planning to stand with this fucking cyborg Hell no. for 20 or for 15 minutes? Dude, fuck that. I mean, That's I hope crazy. He does. I hope he does. But yeah, know. yeah. I mean, it'd be great if he wants great, to but win. It's like, you know, no force force to bet on your mortgage or something. It's <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I'm going to no. bet on a little bit of ground action if he's I mean, if he has any sense, but he and he does. So I we'll think see. that's why I'm more excited for that fight. It's like this like mystery fight. 
Like is Alex at 205 is going to be this monster. Jan can't take him down. He's forced strike with me, knocks his head off. The light heavyweight division could use that, especially with, you know, Jamal Hill being out. Yuri's hopefully coming back. And then uh, there's so many fun matchups for Alex. I'm just, I'm, I don't know. I'm more excited about that. The the one, tell, tell me where you got the temperature on this. Tony Ferguson, Bobby Green. Does Tony Ferguson make you more sad or does BJ Penn's downfall make you sadder? BJ says, well, um, <laughs> Jesus. It's a tough one, right? The night is young. <laughs> um, I will say, uh, Penn. Penn. Um, I think he's a Hall because, of Famer. First ballot Hall of Famer. Dude, but people just, if you missed BJ Penn's prime, Oof. I don't even know what to tell you. You know, like, try, and I use this word sometimes, maybe a little bit too much, but this was one guy. When I did, I remember, I remember after he beat, maybe it was the Shirk fight, or maybe it was the Diego fight. I, I'm not sure which one. Maybe it was the Diego fight. I remember thinking, like, dude, there isn't a, and of course, this was later proven not true, but the way in which he looked, like, when, okay, you know this. When BJ Penn was all in, in his prime with the Marinovich brothers, dude, he was absolutely terrifying. The terrifying. Best. The best. You just can't even imagine. Dude, and to this point, like, you know, this is getting a little bit esoteric. Uh, Craig Jones has talked about it. But like octopus guard is a thing you see a little bit more now in certainly in jiu-jitsu, but in MMA. But he was doing octopus guard back takes in the second Hughes fight. This is a long time ago. Like, like people ask, like, whose game would translate to today? And I think something's going to have to be changed around for just about anybody you pick. But if I had to pick, like, a guy in his prime to come and compete and, like, you know, do well, do prime BJ, impossible to take down, impossible to hurt, could hard puncher and jujitsu like you'd never seen before. Yeah, dude, he is. He Good was a everywhere. fucking phenom. And then to go from that to, like, all the losses and then that, like, super weird run for governor thing after he was having Did you ever pay any you know, attention uh, to that i paid it i just tuned in to one of his like <laughs> like town you know halls. what dude i i just like, one of his town halls i couldn't and i he couldn't. wanted nascar in in hawaii he was like he was like we need nascar i'm like this is fantastic this dude, is like great. what makes people i don't know like what makes people think after a lifetime of fist fighting that they would be a good candidate for municipal governance of an important <laughs> U.S. state. It's insane. It's like, dude, this is not even, it's not even in the same, I, I you know, it kind of bummed me out to be honest. Yeah. It kind of bummed me out. I, I think and Ferguson, Ferguson has had, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say Ferguson to me has had some difficulties. Yeah. Um, that's been well known. That's been well known. So my only hope is, and recently I, I, I know he pleaded not guilty to, uh, I believe a drunken driving charge. I could, I could be getting some of that wrong. Yeah. I was in um, yeah. I, I hope that, um, I hope you know he's got a family around him, and I hope that he can be happy and um, live a life with them. I'll just, I just, I don't. These are two guys, man. I really like. I really like Tony Me Ferguson, too. you know, and I liked BJ Penn. It's just I don't know what the fuck happened to BJ, man. But also Tony Ferguson, his prime. Remember when he won like twelve fights in a row, dude? And we were supposed to get that uh, Khabib fight, some what three times in a row. It just wasn't happening, and we didn't know who's the best one fifty five or walk in the planet. Is it you were the Tony Ferguson guy or Khabib guy? And then you you look at his like strength of schedule. I mean, my God, man, he's fought, he fought killers, dude. Even you know yeah. he's had this tough run with the losses, but they're not throwing them easy guys, man. They're throwing to the fucking wolves, which I don't get that. I don't get it. I, I, I I've never understood that. He's just getting thrown to the fucking savages, man. Yeah, Bobby Green is. Um, he's no pushover, you know. Uh, I mean, here's the thing too. Like, it was funny to go full circle here. We were talking about elevation and elevation in Mexico City. I think my favorite Tony Ferguson win was when he beat Rafael dos Anjos in the fucking sky in Mexico City, like 7,500, whatever it is, 7,400, yeah. something like that, feet in the air. And dude, you go if you if if you haven't seen it in a while or you don't remember it, or for anyone out there, whoever, go watch that fight, dude. Tony puts a pace on him, and RDA is also another one of these guys who is he'll fight anybody. Yep. He's always prepared. He's always in physical shape. Could take his talents to 170 and at least do pretty well up there. Um, was the belt holder at 155? Like we're not talking about some pushover dude. And Tony put it on him. Tony put it on him without ever losing breath, without ever slowing down. Nothing. Just marched through. Not not through him because RDA was a sturdy. Um, put in a sturdy defensive effort, but he was never he was never in that fight. Like Tony beat him cleanly, and I was just amazed. I was like, "Holy shit!" Ferguson dude, like, was so good, do? so damn good, dude. 
he was so good in his prime. I th- that's what buns me out. Maybe because it's it's fresh in my memory his run, and he kind of he kind of got screwed over. Because remember he was doing a appearance, I think on like UFC Live or whatever, and was walking off stage and blew his knee out. Remember that shit? Yes, he tripped over a cable. He, he had tripped sunglasses over a cable. on, yes. like tripped over a cable, blew his knee out. So then that the Khabib fight didn't happen then. It was just like this string of bad luck, and then the Khabib missing weight, and we just never got to see it. It was such a shame. And then now here we are talking. I think he's the biggest dog on the card. It gets Bobby Green. Oh, my God. I haven't seen the odds, but that would be amazing. I, he's a plus um, 285. Bobby Green's a minus 375. But also, you know, I mean, at the same time, man, it's like, dude, you know, here's the problem with Tony. Dude, he, uh, okay, two problems. One, in general, he always accepted and courted too much punishment. Yep. And, dude, there's just no denying he was never the same after that Justin Gaethje fight. He was never the same guy. He yeah. took a tremendous beating. And remember, it went on. And those are the ones that get you, right? I remember the first time that I had seen this in MMA. I remember when uh, Rich Franklin beat David Loazzo. Oh. And, you know, if you've never seen that, dude, it's it, the fight just keeps going and keeps going. Rich just keeps beating the shit out of him. Dude, Loazzo was never the same after that. You can change a guy. You yep. can change a guy. And uh, he did. Gaethje did. And dude, you just can't, you can't, you can't be in car crashes like that as often as he was, and then just be the same. It doesn't work that way. And I think he paid for it. And now we're at the spot where, you know, unfortunately, I just don't exactly know what he has left. I, I hope I'm wrong. Me too. I hope you're wrong. I hope he wins. God knows he needs it. I remember that, that Tony first Gaethje fight. I remember my co-host Brian Callen, he, he loves UFC. He's not hardcore, but he watches when he can. I remember he's like, I'm never watching UFC again. I mean, he was like boycotting for like three days. He was like, that's it, man. This is abuse. How does no, nobody throw in the towel? He's like, how can Dana do this? I'm like, it's not really up to Dana, Brian. Like, you should be mad at his corner. His corner should be the ones throwing the, in the towel. Dana can't throw in towels. It's not. Mm-hmm. He's like, but how can he clear him to fight? And all? I'm like, yeah, what can you do, man? It's it's tough. It's tough. Uh, people. Those corners don't want to stop fights. Tony would, you know, would never want that fight stop. Remember, the ref had to intervene. Uh, Herb Dean had to intervene. Uh, but it's like I just keep trying to warn these guys, man. You know, it's when you're 28, it's very hard for an old guy who never fought to look at a 28 year old man and be like, dude, preserve your shit because it, like, if you don't, if you don't put in more defense into your style, by the time you're my age, you're like the amount of uh, quality of life you will be sacrificing will be extraordinary. And even more readily than that, it will, it will hasten your exit in all likelihood. Oh, and um, he's one of the, he's one of the toughest. I mean, we should give him credit. Like he's one of the toughest guys oh, I've ever good. seen, but yeah. they're like, like all things, there's a limit. There's a limit. Yep. Well, we can't end on that. Cause now I'm sad, but with, uh, with Poirier, <laughs> with Poirier, Justin Gaethje, do you see it going different? You know, they find 2018, Trevor Whitman and Gaethje say after that fight, we've cha- I've changed my style. I'm fighting more strategic. I'm fighting smarter. I would argue, and I, you know, I know Trevor really well. He was my coach. I would argue that I don't know if he's been fighting smarter. He still fights like a banshee, maybe a little more controlled. But I'd argue that he's fought older guys and it's worked. So we can they can highlight that and go well. Look at we're one whatever four out of last six or six out of last eight since losing a dozen Poirier, I'd say strength of schedule there. You know, he fought, you know, Donald Cerrone, Ferguson, older guys on their way out, RDA, older guys. Uh, So I think he, he, maybe he can say he's fighting smarter, but when you look at certain fights, like, I don't know, man. I don't know if it's, you know, because he did change his style. He's still pretty wild, you know, but then the Fazeev Gaethje fight was pretty damn good. He can be. Yeah. I was just going to say that. So I, I was one of these guys who was like, well, Maybe father time and all that damage. Because listen, I mean, the first guy who will tell you that he knows that his style is going to, you know, hasten his exit and cause problems is Justin Gage. Yeah. He has been very, very upfront with the audience and like he is aware of the cost he is bearing, which is unusual. Most guys are like somewhat in denial about it until it's too late. You know, uh, he's been upfront. He's like, I know that the style and this again, this is even pre all the changes, but still like he was readily accepting the damage, but I tell you what, dude, that Fazeev win was legit big time because 
Fazeev was all over him early. And then Justin kind of stuck it out and stuck it out and stuck it out and then put it on him late. That ability to rally, that ability to push through, that ability to beat to, to the point, a younger guy like that was to me extremely impressive. You know, you ask, like, does he fight differently? I think that I would take something of a middle ground on this one where I do believe that, you know, he is still hittable in ways that haven't um i'll just leave it at that he is still he is still hittable but i think he sets up his offense much more thoughtfully and i do think his defense has to an extent gotten better some of the i'm just going to do this and walk forward recklessness he has removed we talk about like charles Oliveira, right yes like some of the things he's he's taken he's taken out some uh not not you know has he completely revolutionized his game well i don't know about that but he's definitely taken out the parts that make him more vulnerable, that don't serve his interests, that That's make fair. him a target. And then he's better about getting in and then getting out. Sometimes he'll abandon that, but I do think there is a, a noteworthy and important change. I, th- I think when I look at the fight, and you correct me if I'm wrong, I, you know, if you look at the 2018 fight, Gaethje was kind of having his way with Dustin Poirier with the leg kicks and a lot of success. Going to that fourth round until Dustin Poirier countered that leg kick finally and ended the fight, Gaethje was winning that fight. You know, so I, I think if you if fight now and you look from 2018 to where they're at now, Poirier is going to know the leg kicks coming. I think Poirier uses utilizes his grappling. I think he tries to get Gaethje down. He has a much more mm. he's more versed on the ground. He's a legit black belt. You know, that's where Gaethje has kind of gaping holes when it comes to the ground. So I'd assume Poirier's like, all right, we're not just going to sit there and eat leg kicks. If he's going to leg kick, we're going to shoot for some takedowns. I think we see more grappling. I don't think it's going to be this fight of the year that everyone's thinking i, I think gaethje ooh. finishes him with submission Ooh, um gaethje or poirier i'm sorry poirier finished him with submission yeah he might i mean folks forget this too two things that stood out to me from that first fight one uh gaethje was deducted a point for eye pokes inadvertent but yep. it happened twice so there was what was one i'd be curious to see if that shows up again probably not but worth bringing up and then the second part was it, fight metric didn't count it because they have a different set of rules for what constitutes a takedown. They don't use wrestling rules. There have to be MMA um, components added in. But like there was one moment where uh, Poirier was able to lift Gaethje and sit him down uh, almost flat on his back until Gaethje was able to roll and turn and get up. Point being is like that. I wonder if they might decide to build on that. But the big part was you you were right. Like the leg kicking, particularly the inside leg kicking yeah. as Poirier moved into position. But then that big left hand, the huge left hand from Poirier, dude, that thing is, dude, he can stop any lightweight in the world if he lands with that one. Agreed. I just, I, I feel like one way or the other, that, that one's still going to play a role. Are you favoriting uh, Gaethje or Poirier in this? Do you do picks or no? I try not to. I'm not good at them. I mean, I have to for for my podcast. Luke, but, here's you know, my thing. Found- you fan the haters will be like, oh, shop so bad at picks. Hey, bitch, tell me who's good at it. It's MMA. <laughs> I don't know anybody who's crushing it. Like this. Yeah, that's why. Not, not me. No, I don't know anybody who crushes in picks. It's just it's MMA is a motherfucker. Yeah. That's why most professional it's gamblers so don't touch yeah. UFC. They're like, there's too many ways to yeah, lose. Yeah, it's it's so it's so volatile. I guess I would still favor Poirier. I do worry about the damage that he's accrued over the years and what that might do to him. But I don't know. He, uh, you know, he, he's amazing too. Uh, he is a remarkable fighter. And I think he's just got, you know, I don't know if he's the best boxer in the UFC, whatever that means, but I put him on the short list. Yeah. I put great. him on the short list for sure. He's tremendous. So I probably lean Poirier, but it's, it's a toss Laurel up. from Brendan Schaub. It's dicey, dicey. You know <laughs> I'm with you. I'm leaning towards Poirier. I'm leaning towards Poirier. I, my heart wants Alex Pierre to win. I'm leaning towards Bud Crawford. I am a little bit worried about the, the, I didn't even allude to this when we we're talking about Crawford and Spence, the car crash, the eye surgery, something to, to, to be aware of when you're talking about Spence. So either way, great weekend. You're a busy dude. I appreciate you making time, man. You, you listen, when I need to talk fights, you're my guy. So hopefully I'm not too Thanks, annoying. Man. No, no, you're not annoying. I'm happy to make time for you. Uh, so that's quite all right. I appreciate the invite. And yeah, um, just catch me on uh, fight night, post fight. I'll get you all your Spence and Crawford results and analysis from Las Vegas. Join me. We'll be watching, brother. And then eventually, once you're not so busy, we got to get you out here for a companion, man. That'd be fun. I know. I owe you one. I owe you one. We'll figure so it out, brother. We'll you're the best. Thank you, Luke.